So we are on step two, but before we go into step two, we are going to just spend a little bit of time tonight finishing up um, a, a little conversation about sponsors and accountability partners. And uh, we kind of talked about last a uh, couple of weeks ago, this idea that um, it's vitally important to make sure that there is somebody in your life to keep you from isolating. Do you guys remember having a conversation about isolation? Anybody struggle with isolation in this place? Yeah. And so uh, if you didn't get a chance to watch that online, it is uh, online. You can go back and watch kind of part one of uh, our talk about uh, sponsored and accountability partners. So you want to pull out your little bulletin. You want to take notes if, you, if you'd like to. We're going to kind of finish up this conversation about um, sponsors and accountability partners. And again, we have three P's in recovery. They're power, people, and process. And we're just kind of highlighting the idea that without people in our lives, we are going to struggle, we are going to fail, that God has put people in our lives to kind of help us through some of our most difficult times, and um, there's no better place to find good, safe, and supportive people than right here at Recovery Live. How many of you found a good, safe, and supportive person right here at Temple? How many of you guys have somebody in your life that's kind of helping you walk through this whole uh, journey in recovery. And that's, that's really a huge connection that we want to make. So what I want to uh, kind of throw out there to you is that a lot of the pushback I've gotten throughout my time in recovery as a leader in recovery ministry from churches and pastors and other Christians is um, this idea that we don't need 12 steps. We don't really need to talk about sponsors and accountability partners. We don't need recovery. We just need Jesus. We just need to pray more and read the Bible more. Anybody hear that before? Yeah? And then, and then if you pray more and read the Bible more and you still don't get better, you start to feel like you must be doing something wrong. Anybody felt that way before? that you must not have enough faith. Anybody been there before? And so you get that condemnation going. You start to feel like everybody else seems to have it figured out. Why can't I get it? Maybe I'm not doing it right. And so you try harder. You read more. I'm going to read two chapters of the Bible. I'm going to pray for an hour instead of 30 minutes. And you still keep screwing up. You must not have it. You must not have God's favor you must not have God's grace you're just you don't have the formula you just don't have it figured out and then you get into a place where you say well then just forget it I've tried I've tried to read the Bible more I've I've, I've tried to pray more but I still keep doing this thing I keep screwing up and so you just kind of kind of give up on it. has anybody ever been in that space before yeah one of you all right cool I want to read to you a story out of the Bible because I think it's just a brilliant example of why it is vital that we have safe and supportive people in our life on top of the fact that, of course, the Word of God is living and active. It is powerful. Of course, prayer changes things. I'm not saying that, but God has put people in our lives for a reason. And folks who are struggling a lot of times, they don't want to get vulnerable. They don't want to get open. They say, I don't need church. I don't need other people. I just need Jesus. And I want to propose that those folks are in denial. Those folks are not getting into a place where they can get real honest and start to actually change. And I'm going to give you an example of that. I give this to people a lot before I read the scripture. <clears throat> there was a story about um, a couple of teenagers with raging hormones. I don't know if you can imagine that, all right? So a couple of teenagers, raging hormones. They start to date, 17 years old. They go out to Lookout Lane. Look out. They go out to Lookout Lane. Things get a little hot and heavy. I don't want to trigger anybody. But they make some, some mistakes, and the next thing you know, they've had sex. And it's, they're just a couple of Christian kids. They feel horrible. And so they make an appointment 
with their youth pastor. And they make an appointment with their youth pastor and they sit down with their youth pastor <clears throat> and they just have their heads down. And the youth pastor says, well, hey guys, what's, what's up? And they're like, well, pastor, we, we were out at Lookout Lane and the youth pastor's like, oh boy, oh boy. He didn't tell me he and his wife used to go out there. But anyway, so yeah, oh boy. And they say, Pastor, we're, we're just, we're ashamed. Things got a little hot and heavy. We know we shouldn't have been out there doing that stuff, but then, you know, we had sex and, and we just feel horrible about it. And the youth pastor goes, yeah, well, somebody was there. And what do those kids do? They freak out. They're like, who was there? Oh my gosh, they're freaking out. Who knows about this? They're freaking out. And the youth pastor says, God was there. What do those, what do those little kids do? They go, whoo, man, we thought, oh man, we thought, you know, somebody was watching us. What is that feeling that tells us if God's watching, <laughs> It's a little bit different than if somebody else knows our stuff who has skin on. Do you feel it? When somebody else knows what's going on in your life and they've got skin on, I'm sorry, for me, it just makes it a little more real. It, it, am I, unless, you might be more godly than me, I don't know. But the things that we do in the, dark and in the secret i think everybody in this room would say you know what i kind of know that god's there but it's not as real until i tell somebody else what i'm doing right and there's something very powerful that happens when we confess our sin and our struggles james tells us something happens when we confess our sin one to another and pray for each other something happens do you know what it is it says we are healed. And I do believe that a lot of us are walking around wounded because we won't let anybody into our struggle. Yeah? The Bible is amazing. Scripture is powerful. Prayer is powerful, but we need each other. And I want to read this really interesting scripture out of Acts. And you can get out your paper Bible. We've got life for, uh, recovery Bibles in the back. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll get you hooked up. You can go on your phone, check this out. But it's in Acts chapter 8. And it's verse 27. And some crazy thing happens. And, and it, it's, it's that Philip gets transported. We don't really know how it works, like this Star Trek thing that happens where he just gets transported to this scene God just takes him from one place to another and suddenly he's just dropped in front of this Ethiopian eunuch it's in verse 27 that Philip gets up and there was an Ethiopian eunuch a court official of the, of the Candace queen of the Ethiopians in charge of her entire treasury he had come to Jerusalem to worship he's an Ethiopian eunuch coming to Jerusalem to worship. We have an element of worship where he's making himself available to God. It's a pretty cool idea. I can't get into all, we're running short on time. But he's returning home from worship and seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And what's interesting, it's the same Isaiah that we have today. So he's reading Isaiah. And in fact, we know he's reading Isaiah chapter 53, which is a messianic scripture. In other words, it's about the Messiah. It's a prophetic word about Jesus written hundreds of years before he came to this earth. And so Philip runs up to him because the Spirit says, Philip, go over to his chariot and Join it. Everybody say, join it. Join it. All right. So he goes over to the chariot and he joins it. He goes running up to him and he sees him reading the prophet Isaiah. Please catch this. 
And he asks, do you understand what you're reading? Isn't that an interesting question? He's got the Bible. Isn't that enough? But the eunuch says this, how can I unless somebody guides me? Isn't that interesting? He has the word of God in his hand, in his chariot. He's just left worship. He's just left church. He's got the Bible. He's sitting in his chariot, and he has no idea what the heck he's reading. Isn't that interesting? God sends a human with skin on to go and speak to him because God knew you tell me how you interpret it. He knew this wouldn't be this. I, I, when you hit by lightning, it wouldn't be enough. Is that okay to say? I don't know how else you read it. And so Philip shows up and he goes, "Do you understand what you're reading?" And the guy goes, "Well, how can I understand it unless somebody guides me?" And he invited Philip into his chariot. And the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, and this is such a beautiful scripture. He says, like a sheep who was led to the slaughter, like a lamb silent before his shear, he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, who is this being talked about? About who is this being talked about? Some of you have heard me talk about a guy named Jimmy. Jimmy. Years and years ago, I was in West, by God, Virginia, at a recovery ministry out there. And this guy, Jimmy, who was a mechanic, he'd sit in the way back of the auditorium and he'd cross his arms and he'd just stare at me with like, ooh, like he wanted to hurt me. It wasn't my fault. His wife was dragging him to the recovery program. Anybody relate to that? Yeah dragging him to the recovery program. He was looking at me like he wanted to kill me. I'm like, I didn't make you come here, right? And I would see him back there and his wife was just praying for him to get better. But he was just a, he was a, he was a raging alcoholic and his wife said, if you don't start coming to recovery, we're done. So she's dragging him to come and over time, he's that guy who would sit in the back row Baptist then he would go to the next row and he started kind of getting more interested and pretty soon he decided you know what I'm going to maybe get involved and he signed up to go on a a little uh, volunteer outreach that we had Uh, we got some people who do outreach here right Joey and Tina all these wonderful people do outreach yeah so it was kind of like that just they were going to go do this outreach it was just us going to park cars for a new hospital but we're all going to wear our recovery t-shirts and we're going to just tell people about recovery and tell them about Jesus and he said I can do that I can come hang out with you guys and so he came and and he said John he says I'll tell you what he says uh he says I'll I'll pick you up I said oh that's cool so he comes with his jeep picks me up in front of the house i'm like hey man how are things going good okay about 20 minutes to the hospital he didn't say another word the whole time man. i tried everything i could he gets to the hospital parking lot and he just works like an animal the whole time but like he's angry about it i don't know he's just an angry dude right and he's parking cars like he wants to ram them into the side of the hospital i mean he's just not so we're on our way back in his Jeep. And I said, how'd you enjoy it? It's good. Okay, all right. He drives me up to the front of the house. I said, all right, Jimmy. Be great. Enjoyed our time together. And I'm getting ready to get out. This is a true, I promise you story. I go to open the car door and he says, hey, what do I have to do to get saved? I shut the door. <laughs> I said, what? He says, you guys talk about this Jesus. What do I have to do to get saved? What do I have to do? I said, well, hey, and we did Tuesday. I said, hey, next Tuesday, you know, we could just go to the altar and we could kind of pray together. What if I want to do it now? I said, we'll do it right now, you know. In that Jeep, 
We prayed for Jesus Christ to come into his life. And he never drank from that moment on. Yeah? Now listen. As far... He's the guy, he's the guy that... Next thing you know, he's in the front row. He's excited about what God's doing in his life. One day he comes running up to me. Some of you have heard the story a thousand times. He comes running up to me, and he goes, John, I went through my first sobriety checkpoint sober. He said, I got so excited, I turned around, I drove through it again. All right, that's what he said. That's Jimmy. (laughs) Oh, Jimmy. He didn't need much from me, but he needed me. He didn't need much, but he needed somebody in his chariot with him. Yeah? And I wasn't the best person for it. I mean, I was like, I missed it. It was like going over my head. I about left the truck and was like, we'll do it next Tuesday. You know? God uses. He spoke through an ass. He can speak through me, right? We say that. Pastor Glenn says that. I don't say stuff like that. You know he does, too. He's a bad influence, man. I'm tell- some of you know. He's been telling some jokes this week. I can't tell him up on this stage. You think Pastor Glenn's... St- All right, well, we'll just keep going. All right. Then Philip began to speak, and starting with Scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. Isn't that cool? He had the Word of God. He had just been to church, but he needed somebody on his way home to tell him about Jesus. Isn't that something? We could go to church on a Sunday, have people come into church on a Sunday, worship the whole time go home with their Bibles, and they still don't know who Jesus is. You believe that's true? They need somebody with skin on to tell them who Christ is and what they did in their own life. To explain to them the gospel and how it impacts them so that that overflow of comfort that we read about, that Paul says, this overflow of comfort can comfort others with the same comfort that we receive. When we climb up into those chariots with people and we have people join us in our chariots, we see the gospel in a way that we can't see it sometimes in in a church setting or in just reading the word of God or, or, or praying in our homes. We need humans with skin on them to help us to understand the gospel in a real way. Do, do you got that? Okay. Here's what happened. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. This is like Jimmy. (laughs) What's to prevent us from being, what's to prevent me from being baptized right here? And guess what happened? He commanded the chariot to stop, and here's these beautiful words, both of them went down into that water you get into the chariot with them you get into the water with them you get into the mess with them we need each other we need people in our lives for this kind of stuff to happen i was in a process group again in west virginia there was a guy in there about the fourth or fifth step we're going through it and he goes man i just I've been, I've been resisting too long. He said, I want to give my life to Christ. So we prayed. He received Christ in that step study. Now our church was about three, 400 yards from a river. We're, again, we're in West Virginia. It's November. And he says, what's to prevent us from going down and now me getting baptized. I said, what's going to prevent us is it's November (laughs) and we're in West Virginia. And he's like, and? I said, let's go. And we went down there and he came up out of that water and we were all new creations because it was cold in back here. 
But he's not going to do that on his own. He needed a group of men around him. It was one of the most touching scenes. His name is Casey. He's, serve, he's still serving Jesus today. In the book, the Recovery Live Handbook, FAQ, about sponsors and accountability partners. It's on page 25, okay? I'm just going to direct you there. Men and women in this room, you need accountability in your life. You need somebody with skin on to walk you through this life. And I really hit that hard in my talk last week. So go back and read that, okay? Or watch that. Read about sponsors and accountability parts. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share it real quick. But what I wanna do is just turn it a little bit. And I kinda let the cat out of the bag with somebody already, is that I want you to take out your phone real quick, okay? Just humor me, please. Everybody's got a phone. Please humor me. And I want you to go to your camera. Go to your camera, open it up, okay? And I want you to open it up and I want you to use that little button that turns the camera towards you. Okay? We call this a selfie, all right? And I want you to take a picture of yourself. Just do it real quick, all right? Just take a real quick picture of it, okay? Take a quick picture and I want you to look at that, okay? <laughs> and humble yeah that's good <laughs> how do you find an accountability partner I want you to look at that picture this is how you find an accountability partner is that you have to be an accountability partner the person that you're looking at in that picture that's the most important accountability partner in this room. Do you understand what I'm telling you? In order for you to go and ask somebody to be an accountability partner, guess what? You're a partner. Sometimes we're like, I need somebody in my life to hold me accountable. But you forget that word partner means, guess what? you're going to work on holding them accountable too. Because you're not just here for yourself. Here's what I want to convince you of tonight, is that God sent you here. If it's your first time, he sent you here for somebody else too. I believe that with all my heart, that's, that you're here to stop being selfish, to stop acting like you're the only person who needs help. To not walk in here and just consume and consume and consume. Who are you ministering to? Who are you saying, you know what, I maybe can't be a sponsor, but surely I can give somebody a phone number and say, hey, let's just talk to each other through the week. Let's pray for each other because we both need Jesus. And I promise if you do that tonight, if you collect one number, not because you look at somebody like we always do and say, hey man, I could really use some help this week, but you go, you know what? I would love to just encourage you throughout the week. Something's gonna shift inside of you because you know what? Addicts are selfish. Codependents, don't get a phone number. You got enough. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, though, right? <laughs> some of you got to dump some, spons some sponsees, okay? I'm sponsoring 42 people. <laughs> if I lose one person, they're going to go straight to hell. <laughs> right? <laughs> There's only one Savior, right? And it's not me. Okay. So... <laughs> We're all of us have people, you know, there's this big kick about everybody's a narcissist, all right? If your husband or wife is, is you know, late for 
coming home or whatever. They're a narcissist. Everybody's a narcissist. Look, we're all narcissists to some extent, don't you think? All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have some piece of selfishness in us. And a lot of recovery is humbling ourselves to the point where we start to think about somebody other than ourselves. If we think about somebody other than ourselves, we find freedom. Wouldn't you like to stop thinking about yourself 24-7? Wouldn't it be freeing to just have that moment where you go, you know what, maybe there's somebody else on this earth that is struggling like I am. It's freeing to do that. Again, unless you're codependent. But anyway, no, we'll, we'll have a teaching on that another time. There's freedom in allowing ourselves to partner with somebody get up in a chariot and work together on recovery and so we're gonna let me just cover these bases real quick if you don't know what it looks like to have a sponsor and accountability partner, i'm just gonna go over this real quick and then we're gonna just have a little time of surrender okay Here's what a sponsor is. I'm going to tell you what a sponsor is, and you go back and read the book, and you can check it out, okay? A sponsor is someone who's just a little further along in their recovery work and in their relationship with their higher power than you are. People ask me all the time, Do they ha does a sponsor have to be in recovery? No. They don't have to be in recovery. They just have to be somebody that's further along in their relationship with Jesus, and they are on board with the fact that recovery is something that is helpful and good. They have worked the steps, that's optimal, and they have a relationship with God and others that is producing the kind of healthy fruit you hope to see in your own life. What we'll say is like, go find somebody who is at the place that you eventually want to be. What has Rodney been talking about on Sunday? Who are the five people you hang out with, right? Might have to change your people. And it starts with a sponsor. An accountability partner is somebody who's on the same level that you are. As you work their recover, as you work your recovery work, they're going to be working theirs, and they're equally committed to the recovery pro uh, process. What is the purpose, real quick, of a sponsored accountability partner? Perspective. Number one, one of the most important purposes of a sponsored accountability partner is to provide you with perspective. How many of you know that you have some blind spots in your life? You have some things that you can't see that other people might be able to point out, but you got to have the humility to let somebody... Who in your life right now can tell you that you might be wrong? Amen. <laughs> well, I already know that's not true. <laughs> she might tell you that. You don't let her. Uh -huh. A good sponsor accountability partner can reveal blind spots that you can't see. Anybody know what a blind spot looks like when you're driving? Anybody ever kind of start drifting into that lane and somebody honks at you and you're like, whoa, I did not see that. You got blind spots. And if you don't have somebody watching your back, you're going to crash, I promise you. A good sponsor, accountability partner provides you perspective. They provide safety. And by safety, here's what I mean. They supply validation of past and present experience. They have an anchoring spirit about them that's the source of trust. And they allow you to be vulnerable. A safe person, someone who provides safety, you can go and you can tell them anything and you know they're going to keep it safe. If you've ever been betrayed before, if you had anybody tell your secrets out there before, it's devastating and it, isn't it devastating you ever been betrayed that way before we got to find people in our life and that they're here who you can share some of these things with they provide some safety that you can get vulnerable and open and begin to share your stuff with them a good sponsor and accountability partner provides you accountability what does accountability mean they can assist you in what we call follow through how many of you have a little bit of a hard time with follow through at times? We make a great commitment. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to go out and I'm going to. January 1, Planet Fitness membership. January 2, Netflix membership. Yeah. Right? It's over. January 3rd, donuts. It's over. Some of us need some help with the follow-through. The phone call. 
6 in the morning. Hey, man, I'm picking you up. Let's go. Honking down that horn. Let's go to that meeting. Finally, Sponsored Accountability Partner provides support. They will pray for you. They'll encourage you as you work the program. They're on their knees fighting for you. But I don't want you to think of these four things just in terms of what you're looking for. I want you to think of it in terms tonight specifically of also what you can provide for someone else. Are you a safe person? Are you a safe person? Who are you praying for? Who did you pray for today? Who did you encourage today? Is there anybody right now that you are speaking the truth and love to? I struggle with codependency really bad. Con con like confrontation to me is horrifying. Anybody struggle with confrontation in here? I hate confrontation. Some people seem to have the spiritual gift of confrontation. I do not like, con con I don't like confronting. I respect people who can confront other folks, man. You know what I'm saying? The ones who are like, I got this. I'll go tell them what I, you know. I'm like, whoa, okay, whoa. They're almost like a German shepherd. Like, go oh, sick them, right? <laughs> I'm not looking at anybody over this way. Hey, men, marry someone who likes confrontation. It's great. It's fantastic. Okay, we'll keep going. It's very helpful. <laughs> okay, anyway, I love you. So, Here's what we're going to do tonight. I really think that there's some people in here, and I, I wish we could get into this a little more for what we talked about last time. Some of you are stuck in isolation. We didn't get a chance to hit it because we had, unfortunately, the hurricane. But I, I want to really present this idea that some of you, isolation is your number one coping strategy in life. When you struggle, you run. What we talked about Wednesday is how predators will cut that weak one out of the herd. While that herd is panicking, that weak one, thinking that they are going to survive, actually does just what the predator wants them to and they jump out of that herd thinking that they're going to safety but they're going to their death. I want you to know this. Isolation is not an escape from harm. It is the enemy's plan to kill you. I promise you if you keep isolating the enemy says you've already done all the work for me. Stop isolating. It's going to kill you. Second I want you guys tonight who've been saying, man, I really want some accountability in my life. Are you ready to be somebody's accountability? Are you ready to go up to somebody and have the boldness to be able to say, hey, let's be partners in this. I need somebody in my life and I think I can benefit you. I think I can be helpful. I think we can be helpful to each other. You know, I work out with people sometimes, but most of the time I'm by myself. If I need a spotter, I got to go up to a stranger and be like, hey, man, can you help me bench 500 pounds? Because that's about how much I bench. No, I, that's not true. I got people in this room who are like, liar. You know where liars go? You know where liars go? Washington, D.C. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm sorry. Let's pray. No, I'm sorry. Okay, hey. We're going to deal with folks who are isolating. We're going to deal with folks who have some selfishness, some selfish tendencies to go, I just want to receive. Tonight, I want you to be those who say, you know, I want to give back. I want to put myself out there. I want to, I want to partner with somebody tonight in accountability. I'm going to have the band come up. I'm going to ask you guys to stand. We're going to put some chips up here on the stage, okay? And I think there's some people in this room right now that you are struggling with isolation, and we're going to deal with that tonight. I want everybody to stand. We got some chips up here, and it's going to be an opportunity for you to surrender maybe a, a struggle in your life that you have. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction. Maybe you relapsed. Maybe you're in a place where, where you've kind of found yourself going back to some old habits. And tonight, we've got these surrender chips where you're going to maybe have a chance to come up to this altar and say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. But the real focus I want to have tonight is for you to say, yes, I want to believe that maybe I've got something to offer. It doesn't matter if it's your first night, if it's your 50th night, 
Now, I know people got to go to the bathroom, do that kind of stuff, but I really want you to stick around here, man. I want you to get this because this is important, okay? I don't want to. I don't, I don't want there to be distractions. This is an opportunity for you to make a decision to to say, you know, recovery is a decision followed by a process. And that decision needs some follow through, so you're going to automatically need some accountability. Amen? Would you mind just closing your eyes and bowing your heads with me? Some of you in this place tonight, your struggle is letting other people in, is being vulnerable. You don't like to let people in because you're afraid of what they might see or you've been hurt before, you've been betrayed, you have trust issues. You don't think anybody's gonna ever understand what you're going through, whatever it is. You isolate and the enemy just gets you into a dark tailspin. You have no, nobody to kind of walk you through and help you understand what's going on in your life. If you're struggling a little bit with isolation, maybe you'd even say, I'm not struggling with it. I just, I don't know how to break out of it. It just seems to be the only thing that works. But maybe you're open to just changing that and pushing out of that isolation, letting some people in your life. Nobody else is looking around. Just close your eyes. If you're someone right now, you said, isolation is my number one coping strategy. I want to change that tonight. Would you raise your hand and say, I want to deal with that. I don't want to isolate anymore. I want to, I want to let some people into my life. Would you raise your hand real high and say, yes, God, I, I, I'm tired of isolating. I need people in my life. I'm here because I want to change and I need people in my life. There's some of you in this place, you don't believe that you have anything to offer. You don't really believe that, that, that you can really kind of pour into anybody else's life, but you're here tonight, not only because God wants to heal you and help you, but he wants you to be a conduit that maybe somebody else can hear from you something that can give them hope. And, and, and you have a story, just like Eddie came up here, you have a story to tell. Just like Victor has a story to tell. Wendy has a story to tell. Tara's got a story to tell. You've got some story to tell. Maybe it was just two days ago that, that Jesus touched you and you started your journey. That, that's a story. That's hope that you can give somebody. You want to just maybe take a baby step Tonight, so say, I'll say yes to God. I'll let him use me however he wants to. Would you raise your hand real high? Say, I'm ready to let God use me however he wants. I want you to put it up real high. Wave it. Say, God, use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Use me, God. Up here on stage, we have these surrender chips. They're chips that you take in a commitment to surrender some part of your life tonight. For those of you who are dealing with isolation, if you raised your hand, I want you to just come right now to the altar and say, I don't want to do that. I want to surrender my isolation. I want to get out of solitary confinement. The enemy has used isolation to, to put me into dark places. He's trying to kill me, and I don't want to do that anymore. Just come and get a surrender chip. Those of you who waved your hand, you said, God, use me. I want you to come and surrender your will to him and say, God, I don't need to have an agenda except for the agenda that you have to use me however you want to. I want to be a vessel. I want to be, Lord, I want to be clay in your hands. I want you to mold me and I want you to make me into whoever or, or, or do whatever you want me to do. I'm ready to tell somebody, hey, I am willing to be accountable with you. I want to, I want to work with you. Let's do this thing together. If you can link arms with somebody and say, hey, you know what? We can do this together. I'm with you. I may not have a whole lot to offer, but I'm ready and I'm willing to work with you. I want you to just come to the altar and just surrender yourself and say, God, whatever you want, use me. I'm ready to be a people person. I want to be a people person. Introvert, extrovert, it doesn't matter. I want to get up into somebody's chariot with them. I want to see people get baptized. I want to see people get saved just because I'm with them. I don't even have to say a word. You're going to transport me where I need to go in front of who I need to be in front of, and I want to be used by you. Just come to the altar, and we're going to pray. We're going to offer ourselves to God as the band plays, and we sing one more song. Just come, and let's surrender to him. Unravel me with 
If a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone.
Can we just thank God in this place? Let's just worship and thank you, Lord. Father, we know that we just need you. We need others. We need to have vertical and horizontal relationships, Lord. You put people in our lives so that we don't have to be alone. I do believe loneliness is a choice. Help us to reach out with courage, let people in, not only so that we can receive, but that we can give what we have. God, I just, I, I feel it. I just know that there are people in this room who have so much to offer. And they're just holding back. They don't think they have anything good in them to give. And I pray you would just change that as they walk, as they walk out accountability in partnership with somebody. Thank you, God, for this family. Man, I thank you for this family. And we would be a family. We would stay connected. We'd love each other. Stay honest. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Hey, man, we're going to close with the serenity prayer. We've got some people out for the serenity prayer. Maybe I'll do the serenity prayer. Here they come. Come on, you two. Take your time, man. It's all good. Give it up for the folks who are giving us the serenity prayer. Would you introduce yourselves? Hi, my name is Randy. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I've been set free from drugs and alcohol. Also, I want to testify to what God has done in my life through Recovery of Life. He has healed me from codependency. I no longer struggle with that. He has healed me, helped me to forgive others from, from my past. And I really think, I'm just very thankful for this program. And going through the process groups and just thank you for this place. This is my wife, Wendy. My name is Wendy, and y'all already know all my mess, but I am grateful to be here. Let's do the serenity prayer. All right, God, grant, grant me, the me the serenity to accept, to accept the things I cannot, cannot change, change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever and ever in the next. Amen. Amen. You got five minutes to get to your groups. If you're brand new to Recovery Alive, you're going to go right back there to the Newcomer 101 right next to the kitchen. We'll see you guys in five minutes. Straight on back. It's a little window in the door.